Welcome to the Teddy Awards, to the 30th Teddy Awards. It's our anniversary, actually, this year. Uh, to the Berlinale, to Panorama, where you brought your film Uncle Howard. Maybe uh, in the beginning you can talk a little bit about when, like, did the project, um, or when did you start thinking about realizing this project? Well, the project began really with wanting to, at first, just recover Howard's films. Mm -hmm. um, all his films, to some degree, were unknown or missing, and especially his first film was this great documentary that he made in 83 on William Burroughs. Mm -hmm. And that film hadn't been in circulation since shortly after he died. So I just wanted to find out where, where was it, what happened with the movie. And that process triggered a whole kind of exploration into so many different things that he left behind, not just the Burroughs film. Um, and then in relation to the Burroughs film, I discovered the came upon the bunker, which is in the movie where Burroughs used to live in New York, where all of his archive had been stored for 30 years. And then the process of discovering this was also awakening so many memories and the people who Howard knew really well. Uh, just in the circle of Burroughs alone, I was dealing with uh, the heir to William Burroughs, James Grauerholtz, the poet, John Jarno, Jim Jarmusch, who did the sound on Burroughs, Sarah Driver, the great filmmaker, who was, was in the NYU equipment room with Spike Lee checking out equipment to Howard. and. Uh, Jim on their early shoots and Tom DeChilla. So this whole story around this time started to evolve around uh, the act of searching. So I decided to turn this whole experience into a movie. So mm -hmm. to tell a story that is a journey story about recovering old film, old video, and you know the very much present day story connected with that as far as memories go and what one leaves behind mm -hmm. in legacy and friendships. Mm -hmm. I think one of the really beautiful parts of the film is uh, that you also talk about your relationship to your uncle from a, the perspective of a child basically. Yeah. And how would you describe how, how did you feel about your uncle and what kind of like person was he in your childhood? Like what did he represent to you? Yeah. Well, it was so hard to articulate for so long. Like, that's what why is someone? <laughs> that's why I made a film. Yeah. And, good um, choice. Yeah, very good choice. And I found that footage, which I hadn't remembered mm. videotaping him. I remembered having strong memories, um, but nothing so specific. And then I found these home videos where he's, you see in the movie, he's giving me a camera and I'm filming him. And I think that kind of, you know, that image of looking up at somebody kind of, sums it up in a way. I mean, he was so charismatic. He, he gave me, like everyone else, you know, his undivided attention. He was really there with you and for you and was this exciting guy making movies. And so he was bigger than life to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up, he stayed the same and frozen in that moment to me. So um, I really wanted to preserve that that way of looking at someone mm -hmm. through a child's eyes. I'm glad mm -hmm. that comes across. Mm -hmm. um, it does, it yeah. really does, and yeah. it's very beautiful. And I was actually wondering, after I watched the film, um, so obviously, like, like in his mid-20s, he chose film to convey you know, his point of view on life, basically. Yeah. But I, I was really wondering, what do you think was driving him in the end? You know, I feel like as storytellers, like we choose different media, and, and film is one, and he, and he did choose film. But what, like, essentially was driving him in the end to, you know, convey stuff through film? What mm. comes before that, if you know what I mean, with him? Well, I think um, Howard viewed his, the time period that he came out of the late 70s mm. in New York as a, as a kind of renaissance period. And I can't, you have to consider that, of course, Burroughs and Robert Wilson not only being these incredible artistic forces, we're also, you know, uh, homosexual pioneers and leaders, especially Burroughs. I mean, to a whole generation, him and Ginsburg opened up, you know, that, that possibility to kind of be free sexually and put it into your work. Um, so I think he was very interested in highlighting what was going on at this very moment with these artists the documentaries anyway with Burroughs and Robert Wilson, looking at them as you know artists, but putting it in the context of shedding spotlight on this time period. Mm -hmm. He was very interested in this incredible crossover of, 
arts and culture that was happening then. And I actually found out he had a project that he was developing with David Bowie, which never got, obviously, when, when, <laughs> completed. When that was, was that? in the 80s okay. when he was in London. Uh, so he was interested. Piece or like I don't know what it would have okay, been. Okay, okay. Something interesting. Something interesting, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was, I think, interested in that and capturing on film this movement. You know, so the Burrowsome is not conventional. You know, it wasn't yeah. like a normal thing to do and go seek out a beat author like Burroughs mm -hmm. and turn his story and his life into a movie. Mm -hmm. It wasn't normal to say, okay, I'm taking this theater director, Robert Wilson, this crazy project he's creating, the Civil mm -hmm. Wars, mm -hmm. and turn it into a story, mm -hmm. you know, on film. So Howard was using his medium, which was film, mm -hmm. in a very new way. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think his relationship was to, because he started out with documentary. Yeah. And then later, his, his first feature, like a fiction, uh, fiction piece, he, he made one fiction piece. Right. Um, what is his relationship, or was his relationship to fiction and, and reality? And what, why did he choose what? And, and versus fiction versus reality? Yeah. Um, well, I think he saw, I mean, I think in general he saw the whole thing as, as just film. I don't know mm -hmm. if he distinguished it so much. Mm -hmm. And I mean, having made a, a documentary which I approached like a narrative film, I mean, I. I think it's just storytelling on, mm -hmm. on film. It's more about the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he was like, I'm doing a documentary right now and then I'm doing fiction. I think he he was very much um, you know, an artist of his time. And so going from two very complicated documentaries to a very complicated narrative feature, I think, you know, I can see the connections because um, it was in Bloodhounds Broadway was inspired by Damon Runyon. American author, it was a wide scope of stories that he brought together and created characters to, to tell one. So I think that one was, I mean, Bloodhounds is a tricky film because I do think it's a, a good film, but he was very sick when he was making it and wasn't able to complete the film finally, so one doesn't really know how it could have turned out. Um, but with Bloodhounds, he was exploring, you know, an old New York era. He was exploring, and this is also very interesting, The it was the New Year's Eve 1929, the fall of the stock market crash, it's kind of end of an era, mm -hmm. it sets up the whole film. And it has always been interesting to me that Howard's film on an end of a New York era coincides with the release of Bloodhounds of Broadway, which is 1989, which is also the end of another era in New York, which is the era of this kind of cultural, sexual, political boom, this positive step forward, which gets totally decimated by the AIDS at the time. So I, I think that was there also for Howard going on. So even though it was this fiction, you know, narrative film starring Madonna and Matt Dillon and had all this Hollywood pizzazz to it, underneath it all, I think we're still, he was still working with the same kind of themes that he was interested in and where he was coming from. Mm -hmm. Do you think the question, like, where his career could have gone if he hadn't died is relevant? Do, did you ever think about that, or...? Oh, all the time. I mm -hmm. think, um, I mean, not just as his nephew, yeah. you know, how great it would be to have Howard around still, but just as a film maker and a film enthusiast, uh, it would have been really exciting to see what he would have done, because, you know, to navigate the world of William Burroughs is very complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, Burroughs didn't trust anybody, mm. yet he trusted Howard to, to put his life into a mm. movie. Robert Wilson, same thing, but very different mm. uh, world. Then he's 33 and he's made two documentaries and he gets a Hollywood studio behind him mm. to do this wildly ambitious movie with all this talent. Mm. And, you know, he, he pulled it off. So you look at a guy like that, he could have done anything. What would he have done? Mm. Uh, what would he have done on film? Mm. And, I mean, I. I I view Howard in the same club as, you know, club uh, group as, you know, Maplethorpe or Keith Haring, and these guys who are really pushing the envelope uh, artistically very far, but mm -hmm. also had the kind of brains and ability to navigate, you know, the, uh, the political, economic world of it mm -hmm. a little bit. So, you know, it was a, a major, major blow. You, you were just mentioning Maplethorpe, and there's also a documentary on Maplethorpe actually playing yeah. at this festival now, and it was at Sundance too, I yeah. think. Um, and and he died too in in eighty nine, 
Like how, as a as a current filmmaker and artist, artist, do you do you read like the late eighties, where so many of these like iconic figures just died, you know, and were gone, and and after that, as someone who works now in, in the times we live in, what what's your interpretation of that period? Well, um, there was a huge backlash uh, because, as we know, it wasn't just the disease. The disease was part of it but you know all of a sudden you know there was all sorts of hate everything kind of came to the boil to the surface there was mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. huge I mean I've had many discussions about this with like Brad Gooch and people who are in the movie and um, you know in the 70s pre-AIDS you know they kind of had New York to themselves and no one was on them and suddenly you have right-wing governments coming in saying AIDS is you know God's revenge against facts you know and suddenly establishment was kind of descending upon mm -hmm. their scene mm -hmm. and um, it was a huge backlash politically um, even real estate wise I mean it, it totally changed the city um, you know Mayor Koch had a plan to get New York out of bankruptcy by raising its tax base so he had uh, real estate incentives to get people who traditionally lived in the suburbs, who worked in finance, into the city. Mm. And they were getting free real estate all the time from all the people dropping dead from AIDS, from drugs. So there are all sorts of these awful things going on. And I don't want to get into conspiracy or not, but all these things were kind of like the perfect storm that, that hit it and hit this era. So I do feel a responsibility, um, having been aware of it as a child and then growing up as an adult and it being close to me to you know, peel back this kind of sheen that was put over everything and to tell the story and to look at it because I think what these artists were doing was so advanced then that it's still advanced and very relevant now. Um, and we should be able to take that with us. I was very you know, struck. St. Vincent's Hospital, which is in the film, I grew up right around there, and that was the ground zero for the AIDS epidemic in New York. And I visited Howard on the you know, AIDS ward when I was seven years old, and all the people dying there. And you know, a few years ago, I started to see that it was being taken down. And you show that in the film. I show that in the film. It started yeah. to get taken down, yeah. to be put up, what else, but you know, luxury condominiums. And I mean, first of all, to get rid of a hospital in a place like New York, which serves how many thousands right. to put up a condo that serves a few is ridiculous it's alone. A right? yeah. it's um, a, yeah. But also this huge pillar that meant something a lot as far as the fight against aid and what people went through to just kind of wipe it out. And it also really made me realize that, you know, memories and legacies don't just stick around themselves. You know, buildings come down and, you know, people forget. So it, it was a real inspiration to go farther and you know, uh, bring out this story and put the story someplace where it can be seen and understood now so that we have it with us and, and all these stories, because I think we can learn a lot from what Howard and all those artists were doing. Mm. Um, my final question, I really would like to know what his um, sort of like position is in, in your family, <laughs> in the wider family too, like what, what role does he still play, you know, like in the family structure? complicated one <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine I mean with Howard there's so many it's it's so complicated because there's a, first of all it was a huge tragedy yeah. you know a real difficult loss for uh, my family and also Howard's chosen family you know or his friends and and I do think it's interesting that now you know, after 20, 25 years, we're starting to have stories from that time mm -hmm. a bit more. And I think a lot of that is, from my experience and from what I saw, mm -hmm. there was just this prolonged shock of mm -hmm. what had just happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that goes along with Howard because he was so charismatic. He was on the rise, doing so many things. So it's a weird mix. I mean, I think He's very entertaining. Everyone in the family is always amused by him. It's this, it's this beautiful mix that's very mm -hmm. Howard of, mm -hmm. like fun and recalling all these fun aspects of him and what he did and pulled off <laughs> with this, oh, fuck, 
you know, kind of feeling. It's, it's like, what a loss, you know. And it's this kind of mixture. Um, before uh, we were premiering the movie, I went down to Miami to show the film to my grandmother, mm -hmm. see what she thought. And she had, I was so happy that she laughed so much. She laughed so much, you know, going through Howard's life, seeing him alive. And at one point she says, Howard, to herself, mm. I didn't know you at all, you know. <laughs> and then she turned to me and said, I think everyone in this film is on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, they probably were, I don't know, yeah, but wow, wow. I think wow. it's just like this huge mix of, yeah. of emotion, Howard. But everyone, I think, is so happy that the film is here because there's so much of Howard in the story. Yeah. And one thing that gets forgotten about Howard because of the tragic end to it is how much fun he was and how funny he was. And he loved life. And as James Grauer holds, the, the heir to Burroughs, told me, if Howard had to pay a high price, he really got his money's worth. <laughs> he really lived. He you did. Know? So I he think did. that's the kind of the emotion that most people are left yeah. with now. And you really bring that across in the film, too, that, that he was in love with life. Thank you so much. Thank Enjoy you. your time. It's Thank only the beginning much. of the festival, so you <laughs> have a lot still to indulge in. Thank you so much. To it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.